right into the microphone, sweetie. I'm so happy that I've lived long enough to see you, and I am grateful to the good Lord that you've lived long enough for me to see you. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's beautiful. And happy birthday coming up. All right, but so far there's no question. No, that's all. <laughs> That's it? <laughs> All right, so now we need a question. I can do that. <laughs> I was just wondering if you have any memories of DeForest Kelly that you'd like to share. Oh. Uh, with, with DeForest Kelly? Yes, sir. Beautiful DeForest Kelly, the Southern beauty. <laughs> I, I have a favorite story uh, <clears throat> I'd like to tell you about uh, DeForest Kelly. I've told it a few times, so, so those of you who have heard it, um, you'll have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, DeForest, um, DeForest was a, a southern gentleman, a true southern gentleman. He, he, um, he, he was soft-spoken and lovely manners and and uh, it was a, a, quite a wonderful guy but you know he, he but but he was from the south which made him uh, like a, a little different I, I you know <laughs> so um, I I learned uh, archery where is he going with archery <laughs> I learned archery by uh, shooting a film, uh, a Western film, and I'm standing uh, beside a tree, and uh, and the director is saying, "Well, the Indians are coming over the mountains there, and you'll know that the Indians are there because an arrow is going to shoot by and 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 launch itself into the tree." I said, "Oh, okay." Uh, an arrow is going to go by me and shoot into the tree. He said, yeah, the director said, don't worry, don't worry, we're going to put a wire from the tree to this gentleman over here who's the archer who's going to have little rings on his arrow and we'll put it on the wire and he'll shoot the arrow and the arrow's on a wire and it goes into the tree. Oh, okay. So I'm standing there and the director says, I said, oh, no, wait a minute. The wire broke. <laughs> the wire broke? Yeah, but don't worry, he's a great uh, archer, and we're gonna put a little piece of tape right there, and he's gonna, he's gonna, sh he's gonna shoot the arrow out there. And the arrow goes into the tree, and it's all goes, I go to the archer, and I say, my God, man, that was really good. Uh, uh, show me what you did, and I'm showing it, and he introduced me to the art of archery. So then, I get pretty good at it, I compete, and, and one day I meet a tall, lean man by the name of Fred Bear. Fred Bear was a great archer and a great uh, hunter. He hunted with a bow and arrow everywhere. And so he taught me. So he taught me to hunt. Which is like, you stalk. <laughs> and you watch. You observe the... Which you, you go slowly, and then which way is the wind? You're full of observation. Have I got you now? <laughs> Are you wondering what this has to do with the forest talent? Well, let me tell you how it goes. So when you shoot a movie in a studio, there's a table, large table, with food on it. And the food is paid for by the studio, not because they're generous, but because they want you to work with energy. So they provide some free food. So I would, every so often, I would sit back and watch people come in, how they eat, what they do. It's kind of interesting. And every so often, DeForest would come in and the Southern Gem would come in to see What's for breakfast? Now you'd think he'd say, uh, uh, any grits? You know? He's a southern gentleman. No, what he would do is he'd pick a 
a bagel. And he cut the bagel. And he put it in the toaster. And he wait for the bagel. <laughs> I'm going to eat a bagel. <laughs> Frequently, when you shoot a movie, you shoot it at night. Because the scene is at night, you go outside, it's dark, it's moody. So when you shoot at night, you start 6 o'clock in the evening and work till 6 o'clock in the morning. That's a night shoot. When, you, when you're with somebody at 3 o'clock in the morning, they tend to talk and reveal themselves. <laughs> I talk with my southern gentleman friend, you know, and we trade intimacies. One day he said to me, you know, Bill, I think I'm losing my mind. No, really, don't laugh, Bill, because I keep forgetting things. I don't remember, I don't remember where my keys are, I don't, I don't remember, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm losing it, Bill, I'm losing it. And I'd say, no, no, DeForest, don't be silly. You know, everybody forgets names. What's your, what's, what's your, oh, DeForest, that's right. <laughs> no, DeForest, it's okay. No, Bill, it's not. I'm, but D, D it's all right, I'm telling you, do, don't, don't worry about that. For, okay, Bill. So he's eating, waiting for the, the bagel to be toasted, and I come by, and there's uh, Leonard. I said, Leonard, distract D. So Leonard says, uh, D, I got something in my eye, would you come over here? And he goes over there, I go, over to the toaster, I pop the toaster, I grab the toaster, put the toaster in there. <laughs> now the forest comes back and he's looking over the thing and the thing pops up. <laughs> and there's nothing there. <laughs> so now, he's lost his joy. <laughs> and he's very agitated. <laughs> Now he takes another bagel and cuts it. Now the joy is gone and puts it there. And now he pushes the toaster and, and now he's waiting. But, but it's no longer, I'm going to eat it. It's I'm going to eat a bagel. <laughs> and I say, Leonard, distract. <laughs> D, you didn't get it out of my eye. It's right. So he, the forest goes over there. Pop. The toaster. <clears throat> and I take the toaster, the bagel, and I don't know what to do. Shove it in my mouth. I'm standing over here, the forest comes back, the thing pops up, and there's nothing there. Now, he's filled with panic. He's filled. He sees me going. <clears throat> He didn't talk to me for three days. <laughs> and that was like that month. Then a month later, we're all in a, um, the, uh, DeForest and Leonard and I would uh, have a, a, a dressing room. We'd, every morning we'd meet there and talk and laugh. And, and one morning DeForest came in. <clears throat> and he said, What's, what, what, what's wrong? He said, well, my dog died. Your dog died? Yes. How did it happen, Dee? He said, well, you know what? I, I have your keys. And I thought, that's right. He, he has your keys, which I think are rats. <laughs> I mean, I have Dobermans. Put your hand on the Doberman. You got a dog. You got a dog. A Yorkie. Have you ever sat on a Yorkie? <laughs> yeah. mm. ah, God damn it! 
So he says, I said, well, how did the dog die? He said, well, look, I let her off the leash. She was running around the grass and she hit a sprinkler head and died. <laughs> That's what I did. I laughed. He didn't talk to me. He did for another three weeks. He didn't talk to me. That was DeForest Kelly, a southern gentleman. gets a, a uh, fortune in pearls or something. You know, everybody comes up and puts a fortune of pearls on the, because he sits on a throne. I'm here. Somebody in India does that. I'm, Hello, bring me a fortune of pearls. Did you bring your pearls? Not today. Not today. <laughs> right into the microphone. Hello, I'm, Hello. I'm Deanna. Oh, Diana. Deanna. Deanna, excuse me. <laughs> You're okay. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I have a question. Before Star Trek ever there happened... There was nothing. <laughs> pretty much. Yeah! But, you guys wouldn't um, exist at all without the legendary Lucille Ball, because she financed it with her studio. Um, do you remember her? Did she come into the I studio? Do. Oh, good. Can you tell me a story about Lucy? No, I'm not going to tell you a thing. <laughs> Thank you. It was very much. No, she she was. I remembered Lucille Ball. I would. I was an event, as a child, a youngster. There was a movie theater near my house on Monkland Avenue, and the theater was called the Monkland Avenue Theater. Strange, huh? And. Every Saturday afternoon, my, I would have whatever the, the dime or the quarter that it cost to go to the film, and they would have like three films. I'd go in in the middle of the afternoon and not emerge until bedtime. I mean, I loved the movie. So I saw all those old movies, and, and they, the, in those old movies with those showgirls, Walking down the stairs, da 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 down the stairs, the pretty girl. One of them was Lucille Ball. Did you know that? No, she was like a, not a Gershwin, but a. Uh, Wasn't she in uh, Sigmund's Follies? What, 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 what? Sigmund's Follies. A Folly. Yes. How did you know that? I I have it on still on VHS. So she would come down. She was a Follies girl, and she'd come down with a feather in her head and. A brief club. With a whip. A what? With a whip. With a whip? Yeah, she had one. She had a whip? In one of those episodes. No. On a Ferris wheel. No, I'm kidding. Yes. Well, why am I telling you? Why did you tell me? <laughs> That's great. So, I, I saw her and thought, wow, what a beautiful redhead. And then she married Desi Lou. Desi Arnaz. And they formed, they were very popular, and they formed a studio they called Desi Lu. Now somehow, and I don't know how, they occupied a piece of Paramount Studios to the point where they put up a wall, a brick wall, that, that was Desi Lu, and the rest of the, uh, the large area was uh, Paramount. And how that happened, I don't know. But Desi Lu had become a separate arm of Paramount while residing at Paramount. So, apparently, Desi Lu thought that uh, this thing that uh, Roddenberry, Gene Roddenberry was calling Star Trek was interesting, so they, they, they uh, I don't think they financed, I think what they did was they sold it, they, they sold the idea to the National Broadcasting Corporation, NBC, which was then like one of three major uh, places where you'd go see television. So NBC then said okay to, uh, to Desi Lu and to Gene Roddenberry, here's the money to make a pilot, to make an hour example, which they would call a pilot, so we can see what you have in mind 
in this thing you call Star Trek. So they made an hour pilot with, um, what's the actor's name who was in the... Jeff, stick with me. No, no, seriously, I need you because... You know what happened to, to, to Forrest Kelly? So, Jeffrey Hunter was cast as the captain, and they made a pilot, and the strangest thing happened. They showed the pilot to the executives at NBC, and NBC said, we don't like it. But we like the idea. So, rewrite another pilot, recast it, and we'll take another look at it. I've never heard of that before, and I've never heard of it since. It's the only example I know of where a studio said, we'll spend another whatever they spend on it uh, uh, to see uh, whether you can make a better example of this idea, this Star, this Star Trek idea. So they made another, so, 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 so then they, they called me, I was in New York, and they said, would you come and see this pilot that we made with the idea of being the captain. And so I went to, flew to Hollywood, looked at this thing, and I thought, wow, that's really cool. I mean, I'd buy that right now. But it was a little ponderous, I thought. You know, they said, uh, like the captain would say to the, to the, uh, uh, the navigator, uh, to the starboard, or something like that. Well, you know, if you're five years in a strange galaxy, maybe you might say, hey, George, turn left. <laughs> so I thought, maybe a little humor, a little light. That was my contribution. And the second pilot sold, and here we are. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Bill Shatter. Welcome to Kansas City. Thank you. Right into the microphone so, so we can all hear you. My name is Gavin, and uh, my question is, what did you learn about life and mortality going to space on Blue Origin? What did I learn about life and mortality being up in space? Okay. <laughs> I, I can handle that. So, um, a friend of mine, uh, Jason Ehrlich was the producer's name. He had produced this series that I did called Better Late Than Never. He was a three, four. <laughs> he, uh, he was wonderful young, he's a wonderful creative young man. And he said to me one day, you know, there's this thing called Blue Origin that Amazon is doing. Amazon, whatever they call it, uh, Amazon Company, is going to put a spaceship into space and, and uh, there's going to be room for four people. And you, Bill, should be one of them. Ah, I'm not going to go. They don't want me. No, no, Bill. I mean, no, Jason, I am not going to go. And he said later, like a good producer, I, took, I didn't take no for an answer. And he called uh, Seattle and talked to some people. They said, well, come on up to Seattle. We'll talk about it. So then he said, I called Seattle. I said, what? Don't you do No, I went, Bill, just go. So we went up to Seattle and entered the Amazon building in Seattle. The Amazon lobby, about the size of this room. In the center, under a spotlight, it's a big bubble of glass. In that bubble of glass is the original Starship Enterprise. Because Jeff Bezos, who is the head of Amazon and was, maybe still is, the richest man in the world. You're the richest man in the world. Imagine somebody saying that to you. Hello. You're the richest man in the world. But I like, I love Star Trek. 
no kidding. So I went in and I met, met him in front of the bubble. And we started talking. It was a friendly, lovely man. And then we go to a, a, a conference table and we sit around and talk. And the shatter goes up and goes, well, and then COVID hits. And we don't talk anymore. A year goes by. And then I read where uh, Jeff Bezos and is going up himself with his brother and a lady astronaut who didn't go up and a young man. Now, where he chose all that, I don't know, but those were the four people going up on the first one. So I said to Jason, Jason, you see, I told you. He said, no, no, Bill, they're gonna, go. and they go up and they come down and then they announce that they're gonna have another voyage a month later. And Jason says, you could go up in the second. I'm not gonna go up in the second. <laughs> That's like asking the, the, to have the, President come and talk to you, the vice president comes and talks to you. I'm not going to go second. <laughs> so they called and said, Would you like to go up second? I said, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I agreed. So I go up second. So I, I'm trying to imagine how much I should tell you about all this. So, I put out an album, it's out there still uh, on Spotify, uh, called Bill. And Robert Cherno and Dan Miller of They Might Be Giants, you might know his name. Three people know his name. <laughs> the same three people who knew uh, this year. Um, Dan Miller, Robert Cherno and I uh, decided to make an album. Uh, uh, write songs for an album, we sell it. And we, and so we, we wrote, I don't know, 25 songs, and we used 12 or 13 on this album called Bill, which is on Spotify. And we got to really know and love each other. And then I get this offer to go to space. So I'm in New York, I forgot why, on a Sunday evening, I'm gonna go to the desert and, and, and get ready to go up in space on Monday. So I meet with Dan and, and, and Rob, and we decide that we need to write a song about space. And, and we have ideas, we're writing ideas at dinner. Next morning, I, I fly out to, uh, to Van Horn, Texas, and it's the middle of the desert, and I realize that there's nobody else is there, except a few technicians, um, because everybody's coming on Tuesday, and this is Monday. Now, why am I here? What the heck am I here for? Why am I here a day early? I got things to do. I got horses to ride. So somebody says, uh, hey, let's get in the car and go visit the gantry. Visit the gantry? Okay. So we drive 20 miles out in the desert and see a large 11, 11 floor gantry, 11 stories high, big gantry. And we're at 4,000 feet. The, 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 the Texas there is 4,000 feet high, almost as high as, as uh, Denver. So when you land in Denver, you, you take your row on, you take your luggage, you're already breathless because you're a mile high. I'm almost a mile high in the air, and there's 11 f f story gantry. There's, let's go up the gantry. Go up the gantry. Okay, let's go up the gantry. So, you know, I walk up three flights, and I'm sucking in air, and then I let's go another another thread. Oh, finally I make it. And, and I'm looking at a room about the size of this. And the the door is open, it's open about I, I see the door is open, it's about this thick of cement. I said, what's that? He said, oh that's a cement room. No, but I mean it's got eleven, it's got a foot of cement all around it. And I see air tubes and electrical communicate. What? They said, well, that's a room in case something goes wrong. <laughs> in case something goes wrong? What can go, what you, what can go wrong? Well, no, it's all right. And we go back down. And we go back to the, uh, back to the, uh, uh, <laughs> 
so we go back to the thing, and and, and I, as I'm driving back, I realize that's why I'm here a day early to see if the old guy could make it eleven flights up at this. <laughs> so the next couple of days, we, in effect, rehearse, and what we rehearse is this: we're going to be in weightlessness, which. The word for horse, where is he going with that? <laughs> Came into the language about 10,000 years ago. The uh, uh, proto-European language, which was spoken in the, up in Mongolia. And, <clears throat> and then they swept down through Europe. And that's how English and Latin and all that came about. Um, but they discovered that the word for horse came into the vocabulary about 10,000 years ago, and so, so they can tell about the past a great deal by examining languages. Not only that, they found bones and things that belong with horses. So not only was the language an example, uh, but verified by other means, that the horse came into our civilization about 10,000 years ago, and, and it, it acquired a name, acquired a word, horse. There's no word for weightlessness yet because only 600 people, is my understanding, have been in weightlessness. So to describe what weightlessness is and say, well, you're floating, but you're empty, and, you're God, and you can do, and you can somersault, but there's no word, there's no way of expressing, really telling you what weightlessness is to tell you, except to say that it's most bizarre thing. So they're training us to, when you get out of the seat, okay, we're weightless, you get out, you have about three minutes, and then they say, get back in your seat. Now the difficult part is to get back weightless into the seat, and you hook your, hook your feet underneath it, and then you're in a five-point harness. So there's four, waist, shoulders, and then there's the, the crotch strap. Now, I've done a lot of fast car driving. I know how to get into a five-point harness. But when you're like this, because the seat is like this, and you're trying to find the hole for the crotch <laughs> strap. I can't find the hole. So, what the hole I can't find it. And I never did find it. And I was crotchless. In <laughs> and then I was crotchless with seven G's on me. So now we get, the two or three days later, we get to the, the gantry, and now the, the rocket is there. And it's, there's gas. It's passing gas, okay? <laughs> it's fulminating, and there's gas coming out of there, and I said, what's that? And they said, oh, it's excess gas bleeding off. I said, well, what's the gas? They said, uh, it, the gas is hydrogen. Hydrogen. <laughs> Have you guys heard of the Hindenburg? <laughs> Have you seen that footage on the Hindenburg? Where everything is burning? Little people are running away, <laughs> screaming, and the announcer who's announcing the, the Hindenburg came into uh, New Jersey, and and they they got a rope up to it and tied off this lighter than air 300 foot zeppelin that would go across the ocean with about 30 or 40 passengers. It was the f first lighter than air spaceship, really, and so it got to New Jersey and they they tied it off. They moored it like a boat, but they didn't know then. We now know static electricity with and across the aluminized body to the far end where one of the bags of hydrogen was leaking, ignited that, the whole thing exploded, and this announcer saying, Oh the humanity of it all and and, and people are little people are running away as, as it's burning. That's hydrogen <laughs> And they're putting hydrogen in this thing! And then, 
I'm thinking, why am I here? <laughs> if anybody wants, if we're, 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 we're removing the gantry. If anybody wants to get off, get off now. And I start to loosen up. I think, I'll go. And then I think, I'm Captain Kirk, I can't go. <laughs> And I'm in waitlessness, release, uh, get out, they're floating around, I don't want to float around, and I get to the window, and I'm looking at the window, but I'm looking back, and I'm seeing the earth, and I'm seeing the wake of the air. I've never heard that described before. I'm like, I'm seeing the wake, I look up there, and there's the blackness of space. It's palpable blackness. I see death. I see life. And I found a profound sadness. And I went back into his chair and I got in the chair and we land. And when we landed, I got out. I was crying. I was weeping. And I didn't know why. And it took me a couple of hours to realize I was in grief. And what was I in grief for? I've been an ecologist a long time. I've known about global warming for a long time. And I realized that I had seen the earth, I had seen death, and I was aware of us. As we were up there in the air, so many entities had gone extinct. Because things are going extinct right now, as I'm talking to you. Things that we didn't know existed took 3.8 billion years to evolve. And we don't even know they existed, they've gone. Is that sad? Is that like, life is sacred. And we don't know how beautiful those things were, whether they were insects or major animals. Thank God. I've written a song, which I hope will become a music video, called So Fragile, So Blue. And it's a song, and intertwined in the lyrics is, what can we do? And I hope there will be major celebrities who will say those words, what can we do? Because I say to you, what can we do? Because we've got to do something. What can we do? What can we do? Thank you very much, everybody. Good night. Thank you.